Lo-fi magic. Son of a mother who got bit by a monkey in a zoo. Hi guys, welcome back to the channel. It's Sean Palmer, Broadway and Sex in the City actor, bringing you that quality content twice a week, unless I'm lazy or depressed. In celebration of the fact that we're all kind of sitting at home and maybe a little bit lonely and starved for affection, I thought, let's French. Hello you guys, uh, welcome to Paris. I want to know if you want to go for a cappuccino or flat white or something. Um, maybe not, I don't know. If not, um, I'll meet up later. Um, don't forget to go to Spotify for the playlist for these episodes and uh, like and subscribe and comment, okay, please? I'm a bit of a Francophile. I started studying French in high school. I never mastered it. I try to read it. I've done Rosetta Stone. I've done Pimsleur. What's the one with the owl, that little green owl? I have a stack of French books in this other room. French cuss words, French slang. I don't feel confident enough to have a conversation with a native speaker. Wait, your tempting aunt is spending your time so much. You have so many horse flies in your tent. I do feel very confident wearing a Breton, so I wear these all the time. I listen to French radio, FIP. I love French pop music, Christine and the Queens. My very first introduction to French pop music was Le Rita Mitsuko in this song called Hey Andy, and I just thought it was so French and so cool. And from there, the 80s kind of had a lot of French influence with Benetton, Jean-Paul Gaultier with Madonna, and Pierre Egier the photographers who took a very famous portrait of Jean-Paul Gaultier in a Breton. So it's interesting to, to sort of find out the history of the shirt. So it started out as a naval uniform in 1858, March 27th, specifically. Sailors could no longer just wear their own ragtag clothes in the Navy. They had to wear this uniform. The white stripe is supposed to be 20 millimeters and the blue stripe is supposed to be 10. So the white stripe is twice as big as the blue stripe. And then there would be 21 white stripes and the either 20 or 21 blue stripes and then 14 or 15 blue stripes on the sleeve. Interestingly, there were some innovations in fashion that meant they could knit things in a tube. They were form fitting to a degree so that they were safe on a ship not to get caught on anything. It had a lot of practicality for the French sailors, obviously, because if the, anyone went overboard, you could definitely make them out either in white caps or on the blue water because of the stark contrast of the blue and the white stripes, which had always been quite looked down on. They were worn by marginalized people and people of ill repute, like criminals and madmen and jesters and clowns, sort of the dregs of society. And now even sailors who are going port to port and you know, spreading venereal diseases and picking up whores and getting drunk and starting trouble. There's even a public record in Brittany that, it's Brittany, bitch, that's where it's from. There's a public record in Brittany that a man wore a stripe and was thrown in jail for it. Uh, Queen Victoria had a sailor outfit made for her four-year-old son, and there's subsequently a painting of him. Uh, that sort of changed people's view about the sort of sailor look and the stripes because it then associated it with innocence and childhood and cleanliness. It is said that Coco Chanel picked up this because she used to vacation on the water in France, and she'd see the sailors in this uniform, and she wanted to put it into her fashion show somewhere between 1913 and 1917. But there is a fashion historian who says that actually in her fashion show was the flap that's on the back of the sailor uniform and that the stripes were sort of a later incarnation. For women of the time, it was a real choice to do this and a little bit controversial, you know, in the 1920s and 30s. They were bobbing their hair, which gave a very striking line. These were very graphic and striking. You had all kinds of artists doing the same sort of thing with cubism and stripes. It was a look that was really appealing to the people of the 1920s and 30s because it re represented modernity, although it had been around for, for the better part of 70 years. So there was nothing new about it per se, but it did look very modern. And then there was also a story of a guy called Gerald Murphy, who's an artist, and he uh, was sailing and stopped into a store in France to get supplies for his boat and bought these Le Mariner shirts for himself and for his guests. And because he's an artist, another really great progenitor of this look. Somewhere between Queen Victoria, Gerald, and Coco Chanel, this look sort of seeped into many corners of the world. So it was then copied by fishermen and onion sellers, and it became sort of this ubiquitous design. It's, I am suspect of believing that any one person brought it in. I think it starts in a couple of places and then rolls out from there. It's obviously been adopted by many artists, you know, Pablo Picasso, Jackson Pollock, Yves Saint Laurent designed with it in the 1960s. 
you can find amazing photographs of the most iconic people in them. James Dean, Marilyn Monroe, Edie Sedgwick, Andy Warhol, Audrey Hepburn, Coco Chanel, Bridget Bardot, Man Ray, the photographer, the Beatniks, Kurt Cobain, Madonna, you name it, they've all worn it. It's something that never goes out of style. It's always available. There's three companies that still make a sort of navy type of Breton, including St. James, who made it originally for the French sailors. But so many companies do it now, so you can always find them. Like I said, I actually have one or two lying around the house because I just love them and I always will. It's time for adult toys where I encourage you to enjoy your own company and learn to play with yourself. My first toy today is something I'm so excited about and I'm rather late arriving at it. It's called Mini Brands, which comes in this sort of egg container and has a bunch of tiny products based on all the brands that we know. As you guys know, I'm a little obsessed with packaging and design, so this is like the perfect thing. And also, as somebody who doesn't want to begin collecting again because I've just sort of moved past that phase in my life, these are so great because they're so small, so having a bunch of them is, is easy. The one thing about them is that they're quite hard to find. Now, I don't know if they're still manufacturing them, but you can find them on on eBay and different websites where you can bid for things. They have like little mini bottles of things and mini foods and I'm just really 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 into them. <laughs> So I'll show you some pictures of those and see if you're as passionate about them as I am. It just I live for mini things you guys. It's uh, it's a mini obsession. Astro Man and Telemimi Battle Damage by Kaiju Tan. So I am a big fan of both of these original figures, which are um, Astro Boy and Teletubbies. I used to love both of those things. I actually have a 18 inch Astro Boy figure, which one of my favorite things that a friend of mine gave to me from Japan. This little thing is so creepy. They are so busted up. Um, they really sustained a lot of damage in battle. The Telemimi stands at 6.7 inches tall and is priced at $350 and is limited to 20 pieces. And Astro Man stands 9.8 inches tall. Ooh. And comes with a Screaming Man Omake which is like a little small figure of himself. That comes at $500 and is limited to 25 pieces. Sales are done by lottery at his Gmail account. So if you want information on that, you can look for that on thetoychronicle.com. This one is just one to appreciate. It's uh, inexpensive, but there were only four made. This is Blueberry Nibs by Molly Makes. And I <laughs> just love this figure because I'm obsessed with like little creatures who eat little food and little things and mini things, obviously. And these just have stuffed cheeks. Like, have you guys watched those YouTube videos of hamsters that have um, eaten like their owner made birthday cake and stuff for them and burritos? Like nothing's better. They like shove the whole burrito into their mouth and oh, it just makes me happy. This one is called Fluffy House Winter by Blind Boxes by Pop Mart. So Pop Mart has done these blind boxes. Obviously means that you're gonna get a toy that you don't know what it is until you've opened the box. Um, sort of like Lego minifigure which is not too effective because if you're really good at feeling around you can figure out which minifigures in here but these are boxes so you can't do that these are nine pounds each which is a little bit more in dollars probably twelve dollars those are again available at the toy chronicle shop next one is Meekin Jake vanilla sky I was so moved by this one I just fell in love with it so I believe there were 30 pieces available and they went on sale yesterday Saturday May 9th at 8 p.m. you had to go on Facebook or Instagram and on Facebook there were 20 pieces available and on Instagram there were 10 and I had never tried to buy anything that way but when the piece came out I saw that it was $55 plus shipping and handling and I was like that's a decent price for this figure which I really like and uh he made this edition since he's been lo in lockdown i don't know it just completely moved me so i tried to get a piece and i got one well i got it <laughs> all right you can't use that i was number nine on instagram when it gets here i will definitely do an unboxing but i just found this to be a very beautiful figure and something that i felt expressed something about me and i wanted to get it so um hopefully we can enjoy that together when it gets here and congratulations me. These last two toys are by um, Yosuke Yamamoto. One is called Wish Upon Me Midnight, and the other one is called Sideways Sunrise Edition. And I just thought these were really beautiful, just kind of, I don't know, the like idea behind them, these big giant heads that are actually the most stable part of their body and the bodies are floating up and the umbre, which we have in my home called uh, a bad umbre, 
for reasons I don't need to give here. So they both have a beautiful ombre, bad ombre. The star is 169 and the sideways sunrise edition is 150 US dollars. I think, you know, having these figures, they're not toys, but they have the appeal of toys and it's learning to live with something that's beautiful, like a sculpture or whatever. And this feeling of it has movement about it you want to pick it up or do something with it. You don't know what it is, but it's it's just a joy to have around because it stimulates the mind. So the, that's the appeal of, of toys to me. It's time for what's on YouTube. YouTube. Uh, Kelly Stamps <laughs> continues her meteoric rise to internet stardom. She's at 109,000 followers. I think we just celebrated her 100,000 followers. Miss Stamps in the Stampede. She continues to humble flex, talking about how hard it is to be rich and famous. Um, I'm happy she's making money on YouTube because that's what I'm hoping to do someday. But yeah, her videos are just, they're just continually dry and funny and she's doing things from her bedroom but there is just this sense of self-discovery that's happening she's 23 so of course you know there is going to be a lot of that but she's she's feeling herself miss kelly stamps but it's it's quite sweet to watch so uh I, i'm a big fan there's another one called covid19 yuri wong who is using the op1 teenage engineering synthesizer and sequencer i'm a big fan of teenage engineering and I'm going to do a segment on them in the coming weeks. They do mini sequencers on cards and they have a couple of um, a little bit more elaborate situations for recording sound at home and making your own music. And he took the Kenneth Copeland prayer at the beginning of the COVID-19 thing. Kenneth Copeland is that preacher with the dead eyes. Um, the beautiful blue dead eyes, <laughs> but dead nonetheless. And he did a song with the sample of the prayer, you know, where there's like the Greek chorus and they're like, COVID-19, COVID-19. And they, yeah, the song is so creepy. Um, the only thing creepier than the song is the actual prayer, honestly. And Trixie did her dolls of the 1990s, so Trixie Mattel's channel, which is for promoting her Trixie Cosmetics line. She does dolls by the decade and she did the 90s. <laughs> Wow, they were outrageous. Like, I lived through the 90s. I don't remember them being so fantastic, but uh, apparently they were. Um, ruffles, glitter, you name it. Just the more you could throw at it, the better. You thought the 80s were crazy? Come visit the 90s. And Ken turned gay, I think, in the 90s. So, yeah, lots of things changed. This week, I've been researching still, and I did a channel trailer for new subscribers and people that were la on the landing page. Whilst I was learning how to do it, I ran into this girl called A Little Bit of Monica, and she's a filmmaker, a young filmmaker, and I just found her videos so charming and beautiful, and now she's a filmmaker. They're really terrific quality videos, but of sweet nature, and she does movie reviews, and she's into a lot of the same kind of stuff that I am, so I kind of fell in love with A Little Bit of Monica. I look forward to following her channel and seeing what unfortunately folds there. Next one is Scaredy Cat. If you guys watched the British version of Drag Race, I think Scaredy Cat was the second queen to go home. She's from a little town in England, had been doing drag for under a year, maybe, maybe even just a few months, I can't remember, but quite a character you could tell. And uh, I felt like there was a lot bubbling under there. Well, Scaredy Cat has a YouTube channel and she put up a song this week about COVID-19 called F.U. COVID-19. And it's a long song, but it was really worth it. Really great writing, terrific humor. I look forward to seeing more of what Scaredy Cat has in store because I just, I find her whole concept really funny. I mean, a cis white male who is also a drag queen and straight, uh, bonkers. Lastly, uh, the BA Test Kitchen. So I guess they had this one in the can and Claire did gourmet makes of tater tots and they looked amazing. I've never been so tempted by tater tots in my life, but it was such a weird thing to see this because it was clearly made right before we all went into the new world that we're in. And it, it was such a snapshot of the world that we knew just a little while ago. And it, it made me a little bit wistful. This morning I got up to another Bon Appetit video of Meme Appetit, which is a meme maker, uh, these two fans in England that have an Instagram account, and they actually got to communicate with all of the chefs on the BA Test Kitchen, and it was quite um, sweet. There was a little bit of tension because I think the memes don't go over that well with everybody in the kitchen. Anthony, I'm talking to you. I think that it was really interesting to see everybody's personalities in their, you know, they're at home so they're a little bit more relaxed and it was off the cuff because it wasn't really about food. It was about the memes about the food and uh, about them as characters and I think that's one of the reasons that I keep going back to be a test kitchen is because you get a real sense of these people, Carla and Claire and Anthony and Brad, 
and uh, and I just I really really enjoy their videos. So that was kind of cheered me up after seeing the Tater Tots episode, which wasn't meant to bring me down, but I just felt so sad for kind of the world that we had prior to all this, I guess. Um, and that is my top picks of the YouTube this week. It, was, uh, it wasn't a week for fun as much as it was for learning. Let me know what you guys are watching. I'd love to hear about it. I don't know if you want this, but I'm going to give it to you, just the tip. This week, I had a discussion with a couple of people, surprisingly. I, I, don't, I don't think there was a theme because the people don't know each other, but for me, in my mind, it was thematic, and I felt people were a bit confused by what I do on YouTube. I want to say, most of all, because it's, it's called Lo-Fi Magic, it's really about the, the finding of the things that give you joy, and even if they're silly or eccentric, which a lot of <laughs> mine are, but I'm an artist and I support other artists and people who animate and people who make dolls and people who are creative are no less legitimate than say an oil painter or sculptor or whatever, you know, musical theater artists just as legitimate as opera singers, whatever. So those things give me joy. And this channel is, as much as it is a platform for me, it's also a place where I want to find a tribe of people who are interested in the things that I'm interested in and who can share with me things that they're interested in so that I can get turned on to new things. So it is all a little eccentric. In contrast to what's going on in the world, you could say like it's not needed. But I would also argue that maybe it is very needed. Maybe we all do need to, to have a space that we can take a break to and relax and enjoy and have some fun. Uh, hopefully this is fun for you. If you think it is, please like, subscribe, and share, and comment below, and I hope that you guys are having a good time. I am doing something new with my Friday videos, which you'll see this Friday. Um, I'm going to do a little series, mini-series of videos for the next uh, couple weeks. I really uh, want to thank the new subscribers. Thank you for joining my channel, and I hope to hear more from you guys in the future, and I'll see you guys on Friday.